Welcome, this is Dr. Owen Anderson, and we're looking at my book, Reason and Worldviews. And in this book, I look at Princeton Theological Seminary, Charles Hodge, Benjamin Warfield, Abraham Kuyper, Cornelius Van Til, and Alvin Plantinga. And so in this chapter, we're looking at Princeton Theological and why it began, and then getting into some of Charles Hodge's views on reason and the knowledge of God. So the, the chapter is introduced this way. Within the context of an expanding and growing U.S., Princeton Theological Seminary began in order to meet the need for new ministers. But if Christian ministers are to teach the redemptive claims of Christianity, then what will be their basis for claiming that unbelief is a sin? What foundation must be established in order to make sense of the Christian message of redemption? So if Christian ministers are to teach the redemptive claims of Christianity, Oh, that, I can't highlight it all. That's too bad. Maybe this one will. Then what? Nope. See, the all or nothing. Then what will be the basis for claiming sin, unbelief is a sin? And what foundation must be established in order to make sense of the Christian message? So that's what we're looking at, right? Well, Christianity says there's sin, and unbelief is really the beginning sin. Well, why is that a sin? Unbelief is only a sin if God is knowable. Right? That's, a, that's a general principle in any law. The law must be knowable. If the law is unknowable, then you can't be held responsible for violating it. So is, is a unbelief a sin? Well, then that means God is knowable, and we should be able to show that God can be known. So uh, Princeton Theological uh, stood out in its time for its dedication to training ministers to give a rational justification of the Reformed Presbyterian faith. So it relied on Reformed confessions, particularly the Westminster Confession. And the Westminster Confession begins this way. The light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God so as to leave men unexcusable. So we have three things here. The light of nature. Now that can't mean creation because then the next one is the works of creation. The light of nature is not the sun or any other part of, uh, of uh, creation, because uh, otherwise it just repeats itself, the light of nature is understood to refer to reason. So reason, the works of creation, second, and providence, third, manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God. Take manifest to be, to be like saying, make clear the goodness, wisdom, and power of God, so as to leave men in unbelief without excuse. So we see that section mirroring what's said in Romans one twenty. God's nature is clearly seen by reason in creation and in providence, God's rule in history. And the failure to see this revelation of God in these leaves humanity inexcusable and in need of redemption. That's why you need redemption. So that means the Christian of all persons should be able to show that God exists. So knowledge of how this redemption is accomplished is found only in scriptures. So the idea, the, the worry that, well, People are trying to replace the Bible with general revelation is, is unfounded worry because general revelation is, is about the knowledge of God. Scripture, special revelation, is about being redeemed from not knowing God. Now, we learn more about God in Scripture, especially about attributes like justice and mercy, but it's, it's the source of salvation, not general revelation. And yet you can't explain why we need salvation without general revelation. So the beginnings of Princeton. We see uh, Archibald Alexander, professor uh, uh, of Charles Hodge, said, in my opinion, we shall not have a regular and sufficient supply of well-qualified ministers of the gospel until every presbytery, or at least every synod, shall have under its direct direction a seminary established for the single purpose of educating youth for the ministry in which the course of education from its commencement shall be directed to this object. So you see an emphasis here on training well-qualified ministers. And if you look at the history of the Presbyterians and the other big denominations, you'll see how you have a problem within their ministers in the 19th century. Divisions come up about issues like higher criticism, archaeology, the fundamentals of the faith, and they divide left and right. 
And so you don't end up with well-qualified ministers. You end up with ministers who weren't trained to defend the gospel, who were easily captured over to other worldviews, other belief systems. So this is the goal from the beginning. And um, interesting, it says, to propagate and defend that system of religious belief and practice, which is set forth in the Confession of Faith, Catechisms, and Plan of Government and Discipline of the Presbyterian Church. Provide for the church men who shall be able to defend her faith against infidels and her doctrines against heretics. So you think about the challenges. This is the beginning of the 19th century. And think of the challenges that came up in the 19th century and into the early 20th century that split the Presbyterians, especially over questions about what are the fundamentals? Do you need to believe in the deity of Christ to be a Christian or the virgin birth to be a Christian or miracles to be a Christian? So you have a sense of Princeton beginning with the desire to train ministers to defend these kinds of doctrines. A defense of the Christian faith is a foundational part of the education of its ministers. If they can't do that, then they won't be able to, they won't be equipped to be ministers. And you can look and see Princeton had before it, it had seen Harvard, which had started with some similar goals. And by the time Princeton is there, they would say, well, they're no longer defending uh, Reformed faith at all, or even Christianity, if they're, if they're turning Unitarian or Deist and then Unitarian. Now, Charles Hodge said something which is used by his opponents to sort of make fun of him. He said, at, his, at the end of his career, over 50 years, training ministers, I think just over 3,000 ministers, he said, during my time at Princeton, no new ideas entered Princeton. Now you can see how an American university that thrives on new, new, new research, articles, publishing, would people would see that and say, oh man, that's so backwards. He kept Princeton from having any new ideas for over 50 years. But what he meant was he had successfully defended that foundation. And now was handing it off to continue to be defended, especially to his student, uh, Benjamin Warfield. He had a son there, A.A. Hodge also, and Benjamin Warfield, who we look at in this book. Now, what Princeton affirmed was that we can know God. And it relied on a philosophy. There's some debate about how much it relied on what is called Scottish common sense realism. For our purposes, we don't have to settle the debate so much as see there is some overlap. And Scottish common sense realism affirms our ability to have knowledge and then give standards for what counts as knowledge and what isn't knowledge. And so in his inaugural address of 1812, Archibald Alexander affirmed the possibility of knowledge. And for us, now this is over, let's say roughly uh, just over 200 years later, we live in an age that says we can't know anything. That should stand out to us. These guys thought you can know something? So he said, first, a truth seeker had to ascertain that the scriptures do in fact contain truths from God. Because look, there's multiple books that claim to be divine or inspired. So how do you know which one contains truths from God? And then secondly, he had to understand what are those truths. Now, because pe people read the Bible and they come up with different answers, right? Now, to do the first one, the student has to know the canon of the Old or New Testament and what they teach in order to assess is this teaching from God. And you'd have to consider how do we know if it's inspired instead of having been corrupted over the ages. And then finally, you're going to have to look and see, is there a God at all? Put it this way, uh, to prove that this is God's word, there has to be a God who has a word and can be known. If you don't have that, then you won't have uh, ability to say the scriptures are or are not from God. It's like saying, well, these are the word of Blick. Well, what's Blick? I don't know. We can't know. So we see this, pro, this, this foundation at Princeton based on the knowledge of God. And really, that's where Princeton, uh, what's called now, we call Princeton University, College of New Jersey, originally then uh, Princeton, what it said, its purpose was, was to teach piety and the knowledge of God. Now, when Witherspoon came from Scotland to America, to teach at Princeton, he saw he was concerned with what he thought were idealist tendencies 
left over from Jonathan Edwards. And he wanted to combat the uh, skepticism of David Hume. I'm going to move my cursor on it because I can't highlight. And the idealism of George Berkeley. And in contrast to those, Archibald Alexander and Witherspoon affirmed common sense, which is what we're going to explain here in a little bit more. Uh, now, th this, go this section goes through different phases of the Enlightenment. All right. Uh, the Enlightenment of Isaac Newton and John Locke, all the way down to the skepticism of David Hume and idealism of George Berkeley, fourth stage. So they're defending the stage which says knowledge is possible and we can, through interacting with the world, come to understand the order in the world, the balance, and have religious toleration in things we can't know. So that's the first, the early uh, modern enlightenment. The second, the skeptical enlightenment represented by Voltaire and Hume. Then the third, the revolutionary enlightenment, the search for a new heaven on earth that grew out of the thought of Rousseau. And then the fourth is the didactic enlightenment stemming from Scottish common sense thought, which opposed skepticism and revolution, but rescued the essentials of the earlier 18th century commitments to science, rationality, order, and the Christian tradition. So who is this Thomas Reed? Thomas Reed in Scotland is responding to David Hume's skepticism. David Hume is an empiricist and he's a consistent empiricist. There's a lot to like about Hume simply because he follows out the implications of, of, of uh, empiricism consistently, which leads to skepticism. All we have are sense impressions. That's empiricism. We start with sense data, and that's all we have. We can't, we can't have anything else. All of our ideas come from the senses. So now we have a few problems. How do we know our ideas correspond to what's real? All we have are our senses. We, don't, we can't get to what's behind them. And then our senses always change. So maybe our ideas will always change also. So Reed wanted to defend science of someone like Francis Bacon, Newton, and be able, and, and, and so here's what he said. There are foundational certitudes. This is the common sense. These are common sense things. Foundational certitudes that include our states of consciousness, like I'm awake, Self-evidently necessary, self necessary truths, like one plus one is three, and perhaps uh, things evident to the senses, like I'm sure I see a tree over there. Those are common sense and don't have to be proven. They're, the, they're used to prove other things. So you start there. Now, you might begin to anticipate a problem already, which is this. Different people have different claims about what goes in here. So Thomas Paine has a book called Common Sense, and uh, he, he's not a Christian, right? He's a kind of a deist. He actually does early higher criticism. It's interesting if you read Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson. I go over this in my book, The Declaration of Independence and God, because here they are in the 18th century, and they're doing the same stuff 100 years later, higher criticism is doing and splitting denominations like the Presbyterians. Uh, they're, they're both showing, oh, there can't be miracles, uh, we just need to find the moral teachings of Jesus, not, not, this, not this supernatural stuff. Now, Hume pointed out that these kinds of things cannot be proven empirically by the empiricism advocated by John Locke. We have no way of knowing if the information from our senses is accurate. And so he paid careful attention to how the mind works. But he also argued against the possibility of certainty based on sense experience or the use of sense experience to prove that God exists. His, his book, Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, goes over that. We, we can't use reason to prove God exists. There's arguments for this, arguments for that. There's arguments for all kinds of different deities. We can't have certainty, which means we can't know. So Hume used reason to cast doubt on empiricism. He put them at odds with each other, reason and sense experience. Now, Reed responded to Hume's skeptical method and in so doing made plain his intention to establish a foundation for knowledge. So Reed wants to defend knowledge. And he will say, it is therefore acknowledged by this philosopher to be a natural instinct or prepossession, a universal and primary opinion of all men, a primary instinct of nature, that the objects which we immediately perceive by our senses are not images in our minds, 
but external objects and that their existence is independent of us and our perception. So that's just one example of starting with common sense. It's just common sense that objects exist outside of us. Now, problem is simply not true. All men don't believe this. There are idealists. There are major world religions which say the material world is an illusion. It's not real. So as an example of why common sense leads to skepticism, because people make these claims in the name of common sense, everybody believes this, but what they claim simply isn't the case. Not everyone believes that. So that's what I say here. The problem with Reed is that these are not actually held to be a true among all worldviews. So then we have a problem. You have your common sense. This group has that common sense. Is there any way to adjudicate? If not, then unbelief is not without excuse. So where Hume led to skepticism, Reed leads to fideism. And I anticipate that about both Van Til and then Alvin Plantinga. Fideism. You have to accept this to go anywhere else. Well, why? If you give an argument, then you're not really saying you have to accept this to go anywhere else. You're saying you have to use reason to go anywhere else because you just gave an argument. That's not appealing to common sense then. It's appealing to reason. Now, uh, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant rejected Reed's response to Hume. And Kant argued that the appeal to common sense is the means by which, quote, the most superficial ranter can safely enter the lists with the most thorough thinker and hold his own. Seen clearly, it is but an appeal to the opinion of the multitude, of those of whose applaud the philosopher is ashamed, while the popular charlatan glories and boasts in it. Ooh, that's a shot at Reed, isn't it? I don't think Kant ever actually uses Reed's name in anything, but this seems to be about Reedian philosophy. And yeah, Kant's right, though. The appeal to everyone thinks this isn't a proof of anything. Everyone could be wrong. Everyone has been wrong at times. So that's not a proof. So he says, uh, here's Reed's response to that kind of idea. On the one side stand all the vulgar who are unpracticed in philosophical researches and guided by the uncorrupted primary instincts of nature. On the other stand all the philosophers, ancient and modern, every man without exception who reflects. In this division, to my great humiliation, I find myself classed with the vulgar. So he sets up something which does appeal to Americans. You have your learned specialists who are disconnected from how they were made in nature. And then you have the everyman, the ordinary person. That's like me. I just believe what ordinary people think, what nature taught us to think. So you can see how that's very appealing to the American mindset. And, and Reed said, the things he considers common sense are only doubted by some philosophers or crackpots. Now, Kant's critique of Reed is insightful for some of Reed's common sense beliefs, but not all. Some of what Reed put in common sense just isn't universally held. It needs to be proven. But if the law of non-contradiction makes the list, and I think it does, it seems that it does not do so because it is the belief of the multitude, but because the opposite is literally not thinkable. And, and, and we've gone over a transcendental argument before, which is what Aristotle gave and what I just said here. The, law of, the laws of thought, reason, like non-contradiction, are truly transcendental. They make thinking possible. So insofar as anyone thinks, they're using reason. And you can't doubt the law of non-contradiction because you need it to make a doubt about it. Now, we'll keep that in mind when we come later to say Van Til's transcendental argument. Do you need God for all thought or do you need reason for all thought? So these three philosophers, Hume, Reed, and Kant, were held up as exemplars by their followers, and their systems are still around today. They still have advocates today. Hume's empiricism and rejection of metaphysics, Reed's common sense realism, and Kant's critical philosophy, distinction between the noumenal and phenomenal. So while Reed maintained that belief in God is common sense, 
both Hume and Kant rejected the arguments based on reason that have been used to prove God exists. Kant gave something more like a transcendental argument. And in fact, that's what Van Til says, is he's doing Kantian transcendental arguments. Whereas Hume, what he does is just shows there's no sound argument to prove God exists. Now, if those are true, you may think they're not, but if they're true, <coughs> pardon me, what are the implications for sin as unbelief? If it's, if it's true that we can't know God, then, then unbelief is not a sin. Now, for Princeton Theological, the influence of Reed's thinking is reflected in the general attitude toward knowledge and the ability for all humans to know the same basic truths. The point here is not to show the specific connection between Reed and Princeton. Like I said, not necessarily arguing that uh, because there's people who say there is or isn't or it's more or less strong, but to show there's a similarity in goal between the two. Without reason, Archibald Alexander, first, president, first uh, uh, professor at Princeton, says, there can be no religion. Think about what that means. Without reason, there can be no religion. For in every step which we take in examining evidence as a revelation, in interpreting its meaning, or in assenting to its doctrine, the exercise of this faculty is indispensable. You can't use re you can't have religion and interpret meaning, examine evidences, assent to doctrines. You can't even assent to a transcendental argument that says God is necessary for anything else. You can't even assent to that unless you've used reason to examine it to see if it's sound. Now, the skeptics who claim reason cannot attain knowledge or that there are no such universal principles are assuming in their argument that argumentation is possible and that there's some standard for giving a sound argument. So think about what that means. The skeptics who say reason can't attain knowledge believe they've used reason to examine the arguments. And that's a self-contradiction. So Hodge, in his systematic theology, clearly affirms the role of reason. Now, Christianity, he says, rejects rationalism in all of its forms. This is not a form of rationalism. But it does not reject reason in the service of matters of religion. So in the first place, Hodge argued that reason is necessary in order to understand any revelation. If you don't have the laws of thought and you're given a revelation, you, you don't know what it means. You can't think. So to understand an object of faith to be true, you'd have to intellectually apprehend it. If you say, if you can't say, uh, God is one blick and three grooves at the same time. You have to believe it so you can understand it later. Well, I don't even know what I'm believing. So this is true of objects of faith, like the immortality of the soul or that God exists. If a proposition is meaningless, however important it may be, it cannot be the object of faith. So in essence... If the skeptic presents an argument that concludes reason is not able to apprehend meaning, he would expect his audience to apprehend the meaning of his argument. In essence, such a person uses reason to deny reason. That's a self-contradictory nature of that situation. You need to know what a statement means before you're able to know if it's true or false. And that's the use of reason. And so neither A.A. A. Hodge, Charles Hodge's son, or Warfield wrote their own systematic theology because there was no need. Uh, a. a. Hodge does have a, have a really helpful outlines of theology, but Hodge's systematic was really the systematic theology of uh, American Protestant universities long after him. It replaced Francis Turretin, which required the students to learn Latin as well as Greek and Hebrew. So Instead, you have an English systematic theology in Charles Hodge. So what do the Princetonians say about God's existence? In Hodge, he says, there are three possible origins of the idea of God. The first is that the idea is innate. Second, that it is a deduction of reason. And third, that it is a pr product of tradition. So he argues for the first against the last two. What does he mean by innate? For the purposes here, uh, what does he mean by innate ideas? 
Hodge defined innate as that which is due to our constitution as sentient, rational, and moral beings. It is opposed to knowledge founded on experience. So we don't know God from our experiences, or we don't get the idea of God from our experiences. God's infinite. You don't experience the infinite. And it's not, it's not acquired by a process of research and reasoning. Now, that's the idea of God. That God exists is not the same as the idea of God. Don't confuse those. Like you can have the idea of a unicorn. It doesn't mean that unicorns exist. That is the process due to the process of reasoning. That you know God exists. So Hodge argued that it cannot be doubted that there is such a knowledge, specifically the idea of the eternal. God has put eternity into our hearts. The idea of without beginning, eternal means without beginning and without end. That's not an idea we get from experience. What do we apply to it, though? Hodge has great sections in his systematics looking at how the different worldviews use eternal to, to apply to different things. And if we can figure out which ones are right and which ones are not right. So if we understand the meaning of what is said, the truth will be grasped, the truth or false about it. So this is what Hodge meant by intuitions or primary truths, laws of belief, like the laws of non-contradiction. Non to call a belief innate is to indicate its source. It does not imply the mind is born with ideas. What Hodge meant is that the mind is so constituted that it understands some things to be true without proof and without instruction, like A is A, or the law of non-contradiction. And that's what he says about reason. The judicium contradictionis. Faith, which is believing a doctrine to be true, involves the mind, and therefore it's not possible to have faith in a doctrine that is contrary to reason. So let that sink in. Faith involves using the mind to understand if something's true, and so you can't have faith in something that's contrary to reason as the, defined the not, law of non-contradiction. That's what he means. He doesn't mean my naturalistic reasoning that says miracles are impossible. So I, so I use reason instead of revelation. That's not what it means. That's reasoning. Reason. So in that way, reason, as the laws of thought, is a judge of what is and is not special revelation. Answering that first question. How do we know there's a God's word? Because we know there's a God. And then we can look at the different possible God's words and decide which one is consistent with who God is. Now, someone could say, that seems like you're judging God with human reason. Well, again, it's not human reasoning. The law of non-contradiction applies to the nature of God also. God is God. A is A. God is not the creation. So you're affirming God does not contradict himself, and he's not a contradiction in himself. So it's not the case that reason and the impossible are whatever seem difficult to believe, right? That's what, when people say, you can't use your reason to judge God, that's what they mean. It's hard for me to believe there was a worldwide flood. I just, I can't accept it. And I'll say, don't, don't judge Revelation with your reasoning. Just because it's hard for you to believe in a worldwide flood doesn't mean there wasn't one. Yeah, right. So we got to get away from that. We're not doing that. We're using reason as the laws of thought. So Hodge gives some examples of that. And so someone might say, it's impossible to say that God created the world in six days. Well, it's not, it's not logically impossible, like an uncaused event. It's just hard for you to believe that because you've been trained in evolution all these years from kindergarten to graduate school. So when we say something's impossible in this context, we're referring to logical impossibilities. So, for example, in Hodge's What is Darwinism? He talked about the contradictions within materialism. And the materialist might think that he's riding the waves of the newest scientific advances when he isn't. He's bringing in philosophical uh, materialism. So the role that Hodge gave to reason extends even to this judgment of special revelation. Hodge stated that reason is meant to judge supposed special revelation. So if something comes to you and it's a contradiction, some, some angel appears to you and says, I'm here to teach you about the great square circle. Well, you say, well, then you're, you're not an angel of light after all. You're here to deceive me because there are no square circles. <laughs> 
So it's reason's prerogative to judge the credibility of any supposed revelation. Reason judges what is impossible, not our personal preferences. So that's not the same as setting up a human standard to judge God. During this time in the 1800s, higher criticism of the Bible became popular in academic circles. Yet the scholars who took part and continue to take part in that activity were not doing what Hodge outlined. They're setting up things that are difficult for them to believe, like a virgin birth, making comparisons between different uh, religions, and then saying, yeah, that was just added into Christianity later. The contradictions that Hodge is speaking of are not those kind. He's speaking of metaphysical contradictions about being, not what is practically difficult for a given culture to believe. So I have a quote here from him. That is impossible, which involves a contradiction as that a thing is and is not, that right is wrong and wrong right. It is impossible that God should do, approve, or command what is morally wrong. It is impossible that he should require us to believe what contradicts any of the laws of belief which he has impressed upon our nature. And it's impossible that one should one truth should contradict another. It is impossible, therefore, that God should reveal anything as true which contradicts any well-authenticated truth, whether of intuition, experience, or previous revelation. Men may abuse this prerogative reason as they abuse their free agency, but the prerogative itself is not to be denied. We have a right to reject as untrue whatever is impossible that God should require us to believe. He can no more require us to believe what is absurd than do what is wrong. So we're going to compare that then to transcendental arguments. And what we're going to see is that although a transcendental argument might say, you must begin with God to know anything else, the reason they're saying that is because if you don't begin with God, you end up in contradictions. So what they're really putting as the highest standard is the law of non-contradiction. That's the standard for evaluating any argument whatsoever. So for Hodge and prison theologians, there is within Christian doctrine no tension between reason and faith. And that's my other book on Charles Hodge, Reason and Faith in Charles Hodge. He will place uh, faith in what they understand to be trustworthy. Understanding requires reason. Faith is not simply belief in what is absurd or self-contradictory. One does not have faith in square circles or uncaused events or that two plus two is five. One has faith in what is not seen or even what is practically impossible, like the party in the Red Sea. But even in that context, that, that was uh, to be expected. Actually, it's not a big surprise that, that God part of the Red Sea for Moses. Now, Hodge also believed that the existence of God is obviously manifested by the entire creation so the belief in God's existence is the natural product of the use of reason. If we use reason, we would come to believe in God, the reality of God and his nature. When we fail to use reason, we end up in unbelief. So unbelief is due to not using reason. Not using reason is a sin. So that's to say that God's existence is readily knowable or clear to reason. It's not a deduction arrived at only after strenuous reasoning. So, so it might say you come to the conclusion, but that's after like a PhD or two. No, it's, it's readily available to everybody. It's not a difficult reasoning process to come to see that God exists. It's clear to all minds, however well or poorly educated. In fact, it might be something true with what Reed said. The better educated you are in this world, the, the less you'll be able to see, the more you'll have a veil over your eyes. So Hodge's claim is that God's existence is so clear that it is basic to other beliefs and knowable by all who think. However, we're going to see an unresolved conflict in Hodge that resulted in a failure to explain the clarity of God's existence or its role in the Christian life. He says that reason is necessarily presupposed in every revelation and that a proposition with no meaning cannot be an object of faith. In faith, we affirm the truth of a proposition. But then a problem arises and Hodge is thinking on this subject. He distinguishes between knowing on the one hand and understanding and apprehending or comprehending on the other. So a person can know the phrase God is a spirit without comprehending God perfectly, right? Because God is infinite. You'll never comprehend everything about God. So he says we can rationally believe something to be without understanding how or why. Now, to some extent, this is true, but if faith is seeking and understanding... Can a person grow to learn how and why? He goes further and introduces a new problem. 
He affirms that Christianity does not ask humans to believe what is incredible, because what is incredible literally means impossible. But then he says that a thing may be strange, unaccountable, unintelligible, and yet perfectly credible. So he says that unless we're willing to believe the incomprehensible, we can believe nothing. So what does that mean? Humans, as true as finite, cannot know the subject infinitely, including God, but not limited to God. We can't know anything exhaustively. But Hodge doesn't seem to be answering an objection here, although uh, he does say that it would be unreasonable to reject Christianity because it requires belief in the incomprehensible. Hodge seems to fall into a kind of fideism here. He says that the object of faith can be unintelligible yet credible. And if unintelligible, then how does that square up with what we just saw him teaching about the need to know if this is a contradiction or not? So if Hodge is saying it is reasonably just a scripture, and then that at that point we must accept unintelligible claims, he's emptying faith of the very content he said it had in the first place. When we come to scripture, we see that it's consistent with reason. It doesn't offer us contradictions. So what will happen is this opens the door for the later theological liberals to say, hey, that's all we're doing. We're saying that you have to accept this as incomprehensible. Or they might say the other side. They might say, we're using reason to get rid of anything we don't accept as comprehensible. And so you see already in Hodge some of the tensions set up that in the early, uh, that the, the Warfield and then uh, J. Gresham Machen have to live through in the dividing of the Presbyterians. So for Hodge, the Bible is not the beginning of apologetics or the belief in God. The Bible assumes God's existence, and its message of redemption assumes sin. This sin is, at the basic level, rejection of God and his revelation in creation and providence. So the Bible isn't teaching you to believe in God's existence. It's assuming that God exists, and it's assuming that you're a sinner in unbelief who needs redemption. So the ignorance that humanity is in is inexcusable. They don't know the eternal power of God. And that's easy to prove. I mean, you could just go around and ask people, and they, and they, they don't know God. And you can tell them, oh, you really do, but you're deceiving yourself. Well, you could say that about anything, right? You really do know how to show E equals MC squared. You're just deceiving yourself. People don't know God. They can't prove that God exists. And that includes Christians. They believe God exists, but they can't prove it. But Princeton held that humanity can and should know God. It is unbelief that is unreasonable, not belief. And it is this unbelief that is inexcusable. This implies that it's clear that God exists, so humans are without excuse in their unbelief. It is in this sense that we can do Christian apologetics. But if you couldn't use reason and argument, then you couldn't do apologetics. The above establishes the foundation for the rest of what I do in the, this book. As we look at, and we look at Warfield, who develops the thinking of Hodge, and then compare him with Kuiper, and then Van Til, and then Plantinga. And yet, for all of its favor and its desire to get this foundation in place, Princeton was not able to maintain its position, and in the 1920s, finally became a theological liberal. And from for that next 100 years to the present, I was recently there at their campus, and yet very, uh, very liberal on all the current cultural li liberal issues. Why? What happened? Did reason fail? If reason failed, then we're in big trouble. Or was something not applied about reason? Now, I gave a hint at it already about how there was some confusion here about fideism and reason still. So that we didn't yet get to reason as transcendental, as the source of our knowledge of God, which is our highest good. We'll continue as we continue more as we go through the rest of the book.